TJ, do you care to comment on your post-match attack on Austin Aries last night on Raw? Oh, contraire, mon fair. You see, this isn't about what I did to Austin Aries. No, 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 no. This is about what Austin Aries did to me. Now, I may be playing Neville's advocate here, but you know what? Neville is totally right. I'm the victim in all of this. I was a hero in the Cruiserweight Classic. I went into the lion's den with 31 of the greatest cruiserweights in the world. And I don't mean to brag, but it was like playing tennis with the net down. As if they don't have too much on their plate. The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade. They talk about the things they did that day. They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H. If you were Smackdown. 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 It's Review of Smackdown. I'm John Pollock. And I'm joined by Wei Ting. What do you want to chat about? I don't know. What's, uh, what's in the news? What's in the wrestling news? Well, uh, you wanted to discuss, because Tuesday night, um, they were in Boston. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, we touched upon this on Monday. But the Moro Ronaldo story is not, it's not losing steam, I think, is the easiest way to put it. You have uh, Sports Illustrated covering it, Vice, yeah. Yahoo. Yeah. Uh, All lead stories. Yeah, um, I think it's it's notable up until this point. Everything, everybody but ESPN, basically. Up, to, they've not touched this yet, mm-hmm. and that's pretty telling. Yep, I, I think that reflects pretty badly on them. So Tuesday night, JBL was introduced. There were certainly boos for him um, from videos that that were posted. Not like deafening, uh, nor were the "We Want Moral Chance" deafening, but they were there. They were very clear. There were signs in support of him. There was one fan who had a JBL bullied me sign and was escorted out of the arena. And what what is going to be the WWE's response, if anything? Are they going to attempt to ride this out and just hope this story disappears? A perfect time to do something about it would have been a show like last night's with the superstar shakeup, you know, to, to change a, a, an announcer spot. So that tells me that... Uh, they probably aren't um, rushing or panicking to do anything, uh, you know, because they had their chance last night and they clearly decided to kind of keep their keep their stance and and not not react. Uh, so that tells me that they probably won't uh, necessarily. Um, do you see these chants uh, picking up with with other arenas? That I mean, this is not just a. Yes, I do. A wrestling website story, and yeah. I don't like using that term, but this is this is bigger than there. There are stories that are kind of just within a certain audience, and this, mm-hmm. when you're talking about the outlets we're mentioning, that is that is the casual viewer, that is the maybe non WWE viewer True. that is now aware of this. But that's also the 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 person reading the non WWE fan. They're not necessarily the ones chanting. You're you know right. What I mean, it's yes. the hardcore fans that are in charge of the chants. And certainly, anytime you go to, I believe, anytime they the you know if this story continues to be a big story, which I think it will, and they hit a hardcore market like you know whatever, like a Chicago, like a Toronto. I feel like those chants will definitely be a lot more louder in those scenarios. They they should be thinking to themselves this didn't take place right at WrestleMania because that Raw after WrestleMania crowd or that SmackDown after WrestleMania crowd, I could see you know having a much bigger reaction to the news. Are you talking about the audience that we were told on both shows? It is simply uh, <laughs> the audience exercising their freedom of expression. Uh huh. Yeah. So freedom of expression does have a limit. In sure. terms of whether we are going to yeah. escort you out of an arena or not. If the pr- pressure continues, I mean, I, I I see this unfolding with basically JBL himself, um, giving you know, resigning uh, or at least taking a taking the step down from from commentary himself. Um, I feel like because it's so such a again, it's it's a story not just about JBL, but it's a story about the company's politics internally. And so I feel like they are kind of all in it together in a way. Uh, but I feel like to save kind of face, mm, if this continues, I could see JBL stepping down. Which I I don't feel is – that might be the idea of the WWE's ultimate – like the worst case scenario is we have to get rid of JBL. And I don't think that that's, that's not the root problem yeah. of this. As you've – mentioned this has been and you're seeing it from certain people where they're it's almost like justifying this is the wrestling business 
Like that's some kind of an excuse. No, this is the WWE business because while while this I am sure exists in other promotions or other, there, there's sport, such or a other do- sports maybe. Uh, like I, I imagine like um I am not going to dismiss yeah, yeah, that that uh, that bullying and this kind of uh, culture is I don't think it's as prevalent as something like this, where the ramifications are, are this level of one of your lead announcers ending up disappearing and leaving as a result of this. But, I mean, just focusing this on the WWE, I just – like you just look at all of the stories that are documented and it's it's been presented for so long that these are all just considered oh, – these are ribs. Oh, look at these funny stories about stuff, about just fucking with guys. And it's just – like this it's just been embedded for all of this time that this is this is normal this is all stuff that should go on in any work environment hey wait guess what you're sticking in or or in orlando for another week because i took your passport yeah. and stole it from you ha 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 or the story about jbl grabbing uh edge's ass in the shower hey yeah, that's normal it's a public so, shower it's so normal you're you're part of the boys now yeah you're part of the club. Yeah. We like or, it. Or, I mean, not to mention all the stories of, like, you know, Randy Orton's past, you know, uh, the number of shits that have been found in gym bags. That's certainly not not normal, you know? And I think things like that need to be pointed out just as much as anything JBL's done. I said this on Monday, and both of us have seen this documentary that was done on Moro Ronaldo. And believe me, I'm not trying to make this some kind of, like, ad for a documentary. I have no... Uh, no connection to this documentary other than I was interviewed for it. It was an independently produced, like literally, like one guy, our friend Harris, shot, edited it, did basically everything for it. Yes. And last we heard, what what what's sort of the update on that? Uh, I know that they were trying to finalize and get certain rights. I think they were dealing with Showtime. And, you know, I think the idea was, I mean, the, the documentary was done before Mora went to the WWE. And I think the idea at one point was to kind of that is how the the story could end was that you know here he is he's he's walking out at WrestleMania last year, uh, probably not the easiest ending to do now. So I, I don't know if that's caused any changes if they were dealing with rights issues, but I just I wish this thing was out so that people could just see for themselves. So like you see Moro at rock bottom in this documentary and this was pre WWE it was before he was even talking to them and it just you can just at least see for yourself that here is a guy that's worked for all of these different places and here is the one company where it it was just this environment for him Mm -hmm. that that led to this the bring it to the table was not the isolated incident this be this one thing that did something it was an, an, an accumulation of things. And when you come in and you're a respected announcer and you're winning awards and you were recruited by the WWE, this wasn't Moro going to them for a job. They reached out to him to bring him in. They did not rename him because they knew this is Moro Ronaldo that we're bringing in. So then when you're brought into this environment and then you're told to do this and do this and you're run down here. I mean, that's like what impact do you think that's going to have? Over the long term. And anyway, hmm. I, I'm not trying – listen, I'm not trying to, to paint more Ronaldo as, as a saint. I know of people that did not enjoy working with this guy throughout their career. I'm sure you do as well. But everybody knows what issues he was dealing with. And I don't know where this story goes after this. I don't know if the WWE is going to – actively latch onto this story and try to discredit anything. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if Morrow's going to talk about this when he does his podcast this week. I think he has to address it. Yeah. He hasn't done a show with Boss in um, over a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I feel this is such a big story. He has to say something. Yeah. I don't know legally if it would be wise for him to go into everything, mm-hmm. but uh, that'll be curious too. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to, to see kind of what the public um, – I guess what the public's uh, reaction will be um, maybe a week from now. You know, the story is kind of like a lead story in a lot of places. It's really hot now. But will this momentum carry, you know, let's say if the WWE doesn't do anything a month from now, you know, and, and they just kind of wait for this whole thing to blow over, will it blow over? Or will, I mean, it's really, I think, a, a story spearheaded by the public. 
and and public outcry. Uh, and of course, you know, led by people such as Dave Meltzer, who have been publishing these stories for the public. But I think in order to facilitate actual change, the public needs to continue to speak up. Yeah, so it's it's one that we will obviously follow and cover um, as we continue to move forward. But I think it was pretty telling on Tuesday that this is not just this this quiet story that's not going to translate to something that's voiced on screen. Like yeah. I think that these chants they could continue. Maybe they maybe they grow. Maybe they're a lot bigger than they were Tuesday in Boston. But that's. Uh, I think that's a really big – to me, it was the biggest thing coming out of Tuesday overall, more so than the roster moves and everything. It's just this story and how much of the, the public kind of latches onto it and and voices their opinion yeah. on all of what's happened. It's just really interesting because I think it's such a it – it's kind of a, a story about – Sort of, we're at a time now where there, where there's a real cross section. I mean, it's been happening for the past twenty years, but a cross section between for the WWE, what used to be a really old school boys club type of uh, um, company, and now uh, wanting to kind of give up the perception that they are a professionally world renowned, uh, you know, I guess more more of a, a standard uh, professional environment. Um, it's something that they're trying to promote, but I think we all know, you know, hearing some of these stories that internally from Vince McMahon and his inner circle and even down to the locker room, it's still very much a boys club um, where, you know, this story is kind of something that is uh, kind of kind of points out, you know, and really asks the WWE, what are you? Are you a boys club? Uh, frat, frat house, you know, uh, locker room type of small company or are you an actual professional are you a company, company that launches something like be a star because you can't be both right yeah i think that's that's another thing it's just the the stark contradiction of messages that come out from this company the public message and then the private one which is now becoming a public one so tuesday smackdown i love these transitions uh from boston and we got the we got the inverse effect way. Who was coming to SmackDown after the talent that left for Raw? And the first man out is Kevin Owens with his suit and blue tie. Yeah. And and a bit, a bit of a shaven face. Yes. I was going to not a whole not a wholesale uh shave, but notable. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy looked 10 years younger. He looked different. He definitely looked yeah. different. And before Owens even spoke, we got the shot of the announce team, the aforementioned JBL with Tom Phillips and their newest addition, Byron Saxton, who they did an angle on WWE.com where they stopped Byron in the back to inform him that he was traded for David Otunga. Yeah. I don't know if he even knew ahead of time. That, I'm, I'm sure he knew. I'm sure he I, I'll knew. I'll tell you why. But I, you can't say that 100% knowing I, the pat. I'm saying 100% I'm sure he knew because he is such a bad actor that there's no – like his, his shock was not conveyed as real shock at all. I feel that's how Byron would react to um, <laughs> uh, what would be uh, something crazy. Um, mm-hmm. We're going out of business. Oh, wow. Well, better get my – red tie on yeah. i don't know if this is a character that they've told him to portray kind of this na- very naive you know gullible oh really oh like like just kind of like basically a li- like a bit of a dork you know a real dork i'm sure i'm sure that's kind of the gimmick um i don't know why i guess it's for the heel to heel on on the, on the commentary desk um but anyway, like even his name, he, like if you were to come up with an announcer that was an actual robot that ran on circuits, yeah. Let us introduce you to our newest creation. This is going to cut down on human interaction. We have designed a man that could talk for twenty four hours. This is the Byron Saxton. <laughs> like, <laughs> he just sounds like a robot. It is, it is a robotic name. So, um, yeah. Do you do you like? Do you think there's anything behind changing Byron Saxton for David Otunga, or is it just a change? Well, the what are you saying? Change? No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Like, is there any benefit to either team or either person? Because I find the two just completely, really, realistically ineffective in both of their roles, and therefore both interchangeable. I think Saxon's better than Otunga, but I'm not saying it's any kind of significant change. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand why maybe it wasn't uh, Otunga for JBL or uh, sorry Corey. Corey. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, can do we can we do we have to dance around this? No, we don't. Yeah, it's like they they have they have some sort of quota. They have some sort of racial quota, don't they? This is why Percy Watson is on NXT. Like, is there is there any other reason why he is? Yeah, I'm the only show that doesn't is Two Hundred Five Live, and I mean hmm. this kind of Otunga for Byron Sachs. First of all, what an unnecessary change. Change for the sake of if change. anything, this change for for those two isolating yeah. those two. Only kind of puts a spotlight on that topic. Yeah, I think so. Kevin Owens comes out. He was doing this a little bit on Raw, but it was really noticeable in this show. He's in the suit and speaking very slowly. Did you pick up on this like I did? As opposed to how he he speaks on Raw? I didn't know. I didn't pick up on it as much as you watch, did. Watch the, his cadence next time. It's... Okay. And, I don't know if this – this felt very obvious, and I picked up on it a little bit on Raw when he mm-hmm. was doing a backstage interview, I think, with Charlie. But here it was just slowing down his speech and – Oh, doing the Jericho thing. It felt like that, and uh, a lot of people made that comparison with him in the suit and speaking slower, and it, it just – it felt like something that he was – clearly trying to do sir and i think you know the new shade of like the lighter shade of a uh, gray suit certainly the blue tie and even the the bit of a, a shave i'm sure is him coming out wanting to rebrand him a little bit for a, a different show a different audience he says he has brought the united states title to smackdown and mentions he is from montreal which drew a ton of booze oh Montreal. I didn't. Well, I mean, I didn't. I guess there definitely is more of a, a like sort of a storied uh, rivalry oh, between Bruins and Canadians. Yeah, of course. Which I, I guess living in Toronto, I didn't even fully realize. Definitely the depth of. He says Canada is much better than the United States, and the Canadians beat the Bruins all the time. And then starts speaking in French and calls the fans morons for only speaking one language. He says he can beat anyone in that locker room, and he is here to be the face of America, which I think is a great. Moniker for him. Great gimmick. His I mean, U.S. title. I think anytime a foreigner wins the U.S. title, that is kind of like the de facto, you know, uh, um, gimmick for that person, you know? Like you could have like Lance. a $100 bill with his face on. Like, there's so many marketing opportunities with sure. this face of America. Uh, but, you know, like, who was the last U.S. champion? Jericho. Okay, before that, Reigns? Yes. And before that? Rusev. Rusev, okay. Um,. Uh, you know, the U.S. title really hasn't been uh, – hasn't received much prominence other than Cena's run. On this show, this is the new world title. That's what he says, right? Both shows this week downplayed or ignored the world titles and both the IC and U.S. title at different points were mentioned as the top titles on each show. Um, that cannot be a coincidence. Sure. And I, I hope that's – you know, I like hope – Randy felt secondary to Kevin Owens on this show. The way he was presented on this show – in comparison to Owens, it's true. That is true. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think it's, you know, those secondary titles need a lot more rehabbing. The world titles will always be the world titles, but you need a lot more focus. And if you have a, t- t- a title defense every single week for, for your US and IC title, especially with worthy champions like a Kevin Owens, I think that's a great thing. The other thing that um, I think this kind of, with Kevin Owens going to SmackDown, uh, it basically puts an end t- to his alliance with Triple H. And therefore, we never really did find out what Triple H whispered to Owens that caused him to turn on Jericho, did we? Yeah, what did Owens get out of turning on his friend who said he was going to have his back to guarantee victory over Goldberg? He opted not to go with that insurance policy, lost to him in seconds, and then got a match with Jericho. So unless this was some grand plot to go from universal champion to U.S. champion... (laughs) This is not a great move by Kevin Owens in hindsight. Yeah. Uh, so that's a loose end that I, 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 I assume they don't have any uh, intent of uh, tying up. We'll, Probably not, we'll, Way. We'll let it One go. One of those uh, you got to wait for the story to play itself yeah. out kind of moments. Yeah. Baron Corbin interrupts him and says that Owens can – he agrees Owens can beat up most of the people in the locker room but not him. And says he beat Dean Ambrose so badly he left for Raw. And then Ambrose beat Owens so badly that he came here. So Baron did some MMA math to explain how badly he would destroy Kevin Owens based on that equation. And he is owed a championship match because he beat Dean for the IC title and therefore he can cash in that title uh, opportunity against Owens, who also holds the title. He didn't beat Dean for the IC title. No, but he beat him in a non-title match last week in the street fight, I think was his justification for deserving a title match. Got it, got it. 
Um, you needed a graph to follow <laughs> Baron Corbin's lines of logic. <laughs> So I mean I'm just like now that now that all these <laughs> roster shifts have occurred, we can trace back a lot of the booking in the weeks pr- prior, and question whether or not they made sense. Like so, Baron Cor- Corbin loses to Dean Ambrose, beats Dean Ambrose the next night, presumably to build up to another yes. IC title rematch, yes, which will not occur. So again, I have to ask: Did this writing team know about these roster changes last week? I mean. There were some names that I had heard thrown out there, some that happened and some that did not. Uh, Ambrose, I mean, you just watched last week. That That's the only conclusion you can get. There's no payoff now to that street fight last week and Corbin uh, beating him, other than Corbin is a little as stronger. We, as we maybe. outlined with the heel side, probably shouldn't have been losing again to Ambrose. Uh-huh. Um, and since they didn't have any plans to move him to Raw, didn't need to beat him for the title at WrestleMania. So I, I don't know hmm. how much they... Okay, it's fine. Yeah. It's, it's, in the end, it's fine. So then Sami Zayn comes out. He is the next roster addition to SmackDown, and Owens just can't believe that Zayn is here. Uh, Zayn got a pretty good reaction. Corbin says no one cares that Sami's here. Zane got a, gr- a very good reaction, I thought, from this audience, and uh, I just had to laugh when he came out because, I mean, it was only a year ago when they, less than a year ago, when they had that final uh, match between Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. The final battle, way. Eh? The final battle between Sami Sammy Zayn and Kevin Owens, uh, right before we thought they were going to be drafted to different shows. And I wonder if they thought they were going to be drafted to different shows because the no. build certainly suggested that it was. Now it's time again for another uh, draft of sorts. And again, they find themselves on the same show. So I think these two will be forever linked together. Yeah. And when they did that house show in Montreal last month, Mm -hmm. Owens more so than Zayn got a ton of local promotion. I mean, big outlets in Montreal. And they drew a big house at the Bell Center. I think it was their biggest show there in years. And you have two natives of Quebec that I think that there would be an argument, why put them both on one show? You could put them on both, Mm -hmm. and that would allow both brands to, I mean, you could run a show in in Montreal, and then another that same night in Quebec City, that's pretty far from Montreal, Right. and you have the, do those two necessarily have to be a package deal together on the same show? Not that you're going to make choices based on one house show loop, but in Canada... These are these are your two biggest Canadians, along with with Jericho, who's not mm-hmm. you know full time coming up. But I assume ultimately the, the decision to put them on the same show probably came because they saw a benefit for both men individually to be on the brand. And that's I, I think both are going to be better suited on yeah. on SmackDown. I think Zayn can have a bit of a new life on SmackDown, which Definitely. he wouldn't have on Raw. So. Then Daniel Bryan, or sorry, AJ comes out first. Big chant for him. I mean, if they ever thought of trying to keep this guy a heel, I think it would be a losing battle. Like this crowd just, they've been given the, the green light to just go crazy for this guy. Mm. Uh, he says that this is the house he built and yeah, just said, I'm still here. Pretty that was much, it. Pretty much like a rah-rah, SmackDown for life, babyface promo from AJ, you know, speaking as the leader of the brand, which I think the company is recognizing and the audience is recognizing him as right now. Um, but he still carried that cockiness. So it wasn't a complete, you know, uh, cheer for me, babyface type of thing. And then Daniel Bryan came out stating that Owens and Jericho is still on. They're going to have a match at Payback, and the winner will become a member of SmackDown Live. So whoever wins the U.S. title will become a SmackDown member. So Kevin Owens could go back to Raw, and we could SmackDown could get Jericho instead. Yeah, how weird is that? So now does this apply for the World Championship as well between Bray and They never Randy? stated that. You would assume. There's a lot of weird questions yeah. that comes out of this where it feels like a very rushed together yeah. and not – deeply thought out um, roster changes Mm -hmm. that they've made with this awkward pay-per-view that I feel they don't even want to have this pay-per-view coming up. Like this almost would have been better saved for after this pay-per-view if you wanted. It's called payback, meaning a lot of rematches and a lot of programs that are still uh, coming off of WrestleMania for Mm blow-offs. And 
I don't know if this roster change needed to be ended. This could have been the night after payback, Mm -hmm. and then you start all your programs fresh the week after to build to your your next SmackDown pay-per-view and your next Raw Mm pay-per-view. This payback just throws all these problems in. Or you don't announce any matches for payback and wait for all this stuff to pan out before you... You Wait, those if you have the House of Horrors ready to go, you <laughs> let people know immediately, even if you don't know what well, it's going to be. Oh, we did a survey, didn't we? And we have <laughs> all these great suggestions. If we have time, surveys. I'll pull up that survey because okay. some of the answers were hilarious. And Daniel Bryan then goes on to state that tonight we will have a number one contenders triple threat match with Zayn, Corbin, and Styles. The winner will get a U.S. title shot after payback. So this is yep. really being treated like a world title. Mm-hmm. We are going to create a contender for after the pay per view, which again is n- is not a bad thing at all. No, it's mm-hmm. fine. It's fine. Uh, it's just interesting that if if your world champion is there yeah. every week, do you need both titles? Sure. These three could easily be number one contenders for your world title. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm curious to see because this week that felt like uh, a philosophical change to their secondary titles mm. on both shows. And then, to follow on that thought, our opening match was a non-title match involving our WWE champion Randy Orton against Eric Rowan. Is Eric Rowan one of the bigger losers of this roster swap? I mean, if Bray does uh, stay on Raw, uh, effectively it separates him from Eric Rowan and Luke Harper. Um, And Eric Rowan, I mean, Luke Harper, I think we all figured would separate from Bray, but Eric Rowan seems to have come back basically... as exactly who he was for most of his career, and that's as a sidekick, as an underling of Bray Wyatt's. Without the association with Bray, I mean, you can expect a, a character rebrand of him for him. Uh, and we saw how that worked out the first time, and it wasn't very good. The the what? what was he? What was he? The wine? The vintner? The vintner? Yeah, yeah. The vintner. maybe him and Aiden English will form a unit together as the. Okay. The singer and the, the wine ah, maker. Maybe uh, Steve Blackman can come back and he could be wine and cheese. Oh, boy. <laughs> Orton headbutts Rowan off the turnbuckle, hits him with a power slam, does the Garvin stomp, and then Rowan gets sent into the steps, takes a draping DDT, and Orton's setting up for the RKO when the lights go out and Bray Wyatt has overtaken the SmackDown production team and says that Orton reeks of fear. He knows they will meet again. Well, duh, the match has been announced. And we'll see him in the House of Horrors. And then he laughs. Yeah. Um, so, whatever. Did you hear what Randy Orton, he did this Q&A at Wizard World on I the did, weekend. I did see it. I did see it also in this uh, Q&A at Wizard World. Basically, Randy buried his entrance at WrestleMania. He made the comparison many others did that the snake on the entrance ramp looked like a giant sperm. <laughs> and he brought this up. Without being prompted numerous times in this Q&A. He brought this up when asked a question by a 10-year-old who attended Wizard World. So Randy has no fucks to give right now as far as his uh, WrestleMania entrance is concerned. I didn't even really notice while seeing it at the time. Go back and watch. I couldn't couldn't see. He's not wrong. I couldn't see the overhead shot. So I dug it like I dug the video back up. And man, does it look like he's riding a sperm. I love the fact that of (laughs) all the images in that match, that was the one he had the biggest problem with. And he said he was happy with the match. Like, did you watch the match? Yeah. You were in it. That silence was not people in awe. I mean, I'd love, I'd love to be in that production meeting when they're thinking about that match, you know? So, Randy, you're going to ride this snake down to the ramp, and then we're going to flash maggots, and we're going to flash bugs. And, like, I'd love to know how they would convince Randy Orton that this was a good idea. It's going to be like Tremors, but a fight. Um, so, yeah, so he also said he has no interest in doing another program with Brock Lesnar, which, you watch that SummerSlam match? I can understand that conclusion he made. Mm. So Bray appears on the screen. Yes. And the lights then come up, and Orton gets sent to the floor. Or, sorry, he goes to the floor himself and right into the steps that Eric Rowan throws at him for a DQ in 342. And then Eric Rowan showed us a full Nelson slam, which is his move. His finisher. So we're going to get another match between these two. Rowan and Orton? Yeah. This will be the parking lot of horrors before oh. they go into the house of horrors. Mm. Yeah. Uh... You know, I think uh, everybody's just been kind of disappointed by this feud coming out of WrestleMania. I feel like it's lost a lot of momentum. And 
with the roster change of Bray moving on to Raw, I think it only confuses things. And, you know, I would almost prefer that they just do the match next week on SmackDown or Raw and just get this thing over with. Is there any chance that this would be – what goes on last at Payback? Will it be this or Reigns and Strowman? I think it has to be Reigns and Strowman. Uh, Reigns and Strowman? I mean, that's not even for a title. I know, but – It's certainly the bigger match, you know? But uh, I know that they have a real – Yeah, I guess it depends what if, kind of match this is. If the uh, if it was The Undertaker headlining Payback, then certainly, you know, you put The Undertaker on last. But I, I feel like they would like to justify a world championship match being on last still, you know? Yeah, I just feel Strowman and Reigns will be an awesome match. This will not. Would be my my well, expectation. We'll we don't know that. You don't you're right. You're this. right. Maybe you maybe they're gonna this. wow us. It's the house of horrors, by the way. What did I say? I think you said chamber. The chamber of horrors. Sorry, yeah. that's what I expect the reaction to be. Yeah. The Usos took on American Alpha for the SmackDown tag titles. Uh, another strong match between these two teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got the advantage on Gable early. Then American Alpha cleared the ring, went through a commercial. Uh, Gable hit a pair of exploders, then went for a moonsault to Jimmy, got a two count. Gable then did the uh, the Suzuki armbar and the ropes when Jimmy super kicked him from the floor. Jimmy then hit a splash but got caught with a cradle by Gable for a near fall. Gable just looked great in this match. Jordan comes in, lifts up Jimmy onto his shoulders. Gable hit a bulldog, but Jay made the save. Alpha goes to the floor, stereo topes by the Usos, but then... Gable and Jordan catch them as they dive to the floor and suplex them Mm -hmm. on the floor. That looked great. Yeah. And then Jordan spears Jimmy in the corner. Jordan comes out, gets hit with a super kick. There's a blind tag uh, to Jay, nails Gable, and a splash off the top for the win. Uh, Another great match. Yeah, really good match. Um, You know, they're awfully formulaic. Like it's the same, pretty much the same types of match that uh, you 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 would expect from America. But it's a good American formula. Alpha. But it's a very great formula, and so you could they're always dependable. You can always count on these four to to have a solid match to really spark up the crowd. And I I almost don't mind it. You know, they can go out there have this match almost every single week. And I I feel like the announcers and the and the production haven't put enough focus on on these four specifically. You know. Uh, and Daniel Bryan talks about it, basically admits that himself too. He feels that way as well. But if they gave, like, you, you think about, you know, like the Hardys and Edge and Christian, when they really broke out, they were pretty much in the same spot as these these four guys, you know? They were around, they were, had TV time every week, but they weren't necessarily over. They weren't over until they did that uh, Terry Runnels, uh, Terry Invitation the Tournament. The Tit Tournament. The Tit Tournament with that awesome ladder match that got everybody's att- attention. I'm not saying these guys need to have a ladder match, but a high-profile match where you just let them go out there, have a great match, and promote the shit out of it afterwards. Wow, did you see this match yesterday at that at this pay-per-view? Look at this match. We'll really get these guys over. And so you're saying Terry should come back? Yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Um, but anyway, like the, it's clear how you can get the get make these guys popular. Just let them have great matches every single week. You could st- you could say way if we didn't have the the brand split. This is one of the best tag divisions the WWE has had ever. When you look at all the Hardys being back, Alpha, the Usos, the Revival. Yeah. I, I mean, I would say as a, the roster as a whole, is, and Gallows. I'm saying the WWE roster as a whole is probably the best it's ever been in terms of in ring talent. Like even in ring, like say what you will. Uh, the, the Shining Stars entered yeah. here and then attacked American Alpha, looked to have ditched the gimmick, and, yeah. like, these two are really good, mm-hmm. and the gimmick was the killer for these guys. Like, they are another, like, this is a really great tag division, but it's splintered over two rosters. Um, that said, um, the SmackDown side, I, I think this is yeah, at least something for the Shining Stars. They'll get a chance, uh, which they didn't have on Raw. For whatever reason, SmackDown has kind of like felt like somewhere in between the main roster and NXT, as a, you know, in, in the way that it's it's almost seemed like a, a, a great space for people to rehab themselves. Uh, where where Raw hasn't really provided that opportunity, and I'm speaking about obviously guys like the Miz, you know, who have really uh, you know taken advantage of I guess the smaller roster to really stand out. And you might see the same thing with the Shining Stars. I I definitely think the the tag team division is probably a, a glaring weakness of both rosters that that is probably getting a bit more of a attention, you know, this year. So, yeah. 
hopefully the, it works out. Alpha right. and the Stars, they're, they'll have some really good matches yeah. together. Um, I guess the question is where where the Usos go now. Um, with huh? uh, Build up another team. Well, that's a problem. There aren't really a whole lot of options. Um, maybe Fandango and Tyler Breeze will get a reset. I mean, there there is p- potential. It's not like... Um, the Shining Stars and Alpha could have matches every single week, you know? So even to have a three-way between the, the, the three teams would be fine. They announced that Jinder Mahal has joined SmackDown, and he will be in a match next. So Jinder, after his hey, yeah, killer match with Finn, Finn Balor. Finn Balor, any, any uh, update? Uh, PW Insider reports he has a concussion, which is brutal. Ridiculous. That's crazy. Like, poor guy, you know, first match back on TV. And this one, no fault of his own. Yeah. Like, none. I, I mean, neither was the Seth Rollins one. No, but, I mean, he, he had lingering problems, I think, before the SummerSlam deal, but this one was just, you know, and it's like, Accidents happen. The bu- the the power bomb into the barricade is probably not the best advised uh, m- move. But this was just a- this is just eating a forearm and getting knocked out in the ring. God, yeah, this is a big forearm. And they're not going to dance around with concussions. Like who knows how long this guy could be out. I mean, what was nuts was that uh, Balor continued the match, did a bunch of shit. His running drop kick to the corner, did the coup de gras, concussed, which is crazy. I yeah. mean, the guy's probably done it so much that it's nothing to him. You know, he can do everything automatic. But um, just the idea of, you know, doing the rest of the match in, in, a, in that state is, is kind of crazy in 2017. Jinder Mahal took on Mojo Rawley. And Rob Gronkowski was in the front row. Which, this match may have been the entire reason to move Jinder Mahal to SmackDown <laughs> for this one spot. Because we're yeah. going to be in Boston for Tuesday, and Tuesday is SmackDown. Yeah. We need a reason to have Jinder on the show. Sure. You're going to SmackDown. <laughs> the crowd was chanting for Gronkowski as the match began. There was a flying knee delivered to Mahal. Raleigh then went to the side to run the ropes and ran right into Charles Robinson. Yeah. 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 Raleigh this apologized for this afterwards. Charles Robinson showing some, uh, uh, some good uh, uh, resilience here. Yeah. He, he got touched and <laughs> didn't fall down. Just like covered up and yeah. had to proceed. There was a flapjack to Raleigh on the turnbuckle. And then Mahal goes and gets in Gronkowski's face. Raleigh nails him as Gronkowski tosses a beer into his face, which the announcers made a big deal of at the start of this, showing the beer being thrown by Mahal at WrestleMania. So uh, Gronkowski got his... His, re- his receipt here. I thought it was too much. Gronkowski, like, ca- attacked uh, Jinder at WrestleMania. Now he throws a beer on top of that. And Come to on. be honest, like, Mahal did throw the beer, but he he barely landed anything on Gronkowski. <laughs> like, if, if there was such a thing as protecting a guy from a beer throw, Mahal did it. He beard his sh- shoulder, not his face. This one, Gronkowski just drowned him <laughs> with his beer. And... Raleigh then hit his running right forearm in the ring and pinned him in 243. How, how is this beer in the face not a DQ? He blinded his opponent. If salt is a DQ, a beer in the face is a DQ. I guess because there was no physical contact. Neither was salt in the face, though. Neither is mist. These, these are all great points. Come on. They're not steel steps to the face. That's what we learned. All right. Uh, Raleigh then dove onto Gronkowski and his friends, and th- this looked frightening. Just a little bit of stinger splash onto Gronkowski. Oh, my Gronkowski. God. I would, be, I would have just sidestepped and let him just <sighs> and land then, on the floor. They come back from the replays, and Gronkowski is chopping Mojo in the crowd. Did you see that? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, man. Maybe Gronkowski's going to come in here full-time. Maybe he's going to give up this football game. I'm not a football fan. I'm certainly not from New England or Boston. Um, So I can't tell you the appeal of something like this. But as an outsider, these guys just seem like obnoxious um, douchebags, you know, celebrating. I I just (laughs) – that's the impression I got. Well, ESPN got their story from Tuesday night's tapings. Like Mojo, uh, you know, he's certainly like – had a bit of a resurgence ever since the the the, the hype rose breakup. Um, they're giving him a lot. They gave him that battle royal. They gave. They're giving him these celebrity moments, or at least he's providing these celebrity moments. The question now is, can this guy get over without Rob Gronkowski? It's a big question. Like we saw his some semblance of like what his new character is last week with that weird Andre promo. I don't have that much confidence. You know. Yeah. I don't have that, that much confidence that he could be an over babyface doing what he's doing. He's he, he's the Miz, and Gronkowski is his Maurice. 
except I don't I don't see Gronkowski showing up every week. I don't see Gronkowski. Uh, He's much less without Gronkowski. Yeah. So that's what Raleigh's going to have to deal with now, unless he can talk his friend into coming out on Tuesdays. I really think Mojo, like in his current, I don't know, just with this kind of obnoxious personality, I see him better suited as a heel. And I, if he doesn't, if they don't turn him, I think the crowd will turn him eventually. Shane McMahon came out for the state of the women's division. He thanks all of the talent that has moved on to Raw, and he brings out the women's division. Naomi, Natalia, Carmella, and Becky Lynch. And that was it. Our four-woman division. Mm-hmm. With Nikki Bella gone, with Alexa and Mickey gone to Raw. Eva Marie, you could assume, probably Eva Marie was not absent. Back. And yeah, we may never see her again. Mm-hmm. And... Was Paige a Raw or a SmackDown draft? She was Raw. She and, was Raw. And I can confirm that because I was just recently reminded uh, watching Total Divas. Oh, okay. We could chat about Ooh, that after. So you watched episode one? I did. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, James Ellsworth says that Naomi is a horrible champion and then Naomi threatened him. But then Shane goes to introduce the newest member of the roster and the, all of the fans are wooing. Shane says she is a second-generation performer. Her father is one of the greatest ever and is a Hall of Famer and brings out Tamina. Like, a great, great swerve. It was an excellent swerve. Yeah, this was, it was some really, of Shane's it, finest mic work. It was really great, but it just kind of made Tamina look a bit like oh, a joke. I know. And, and then, then on Talking going, Smack, yeah. where they bring this up that, oh, you you led everyone one way. It's like, ah, oh, you know, you got to you gotta bring them down before you bring them up. It's like, what? Tamina is like the, the low she's, point. She's the punchline. Yeah. You know? Wow. And, I mean, it's a, a little unfortunate because she's been out for, what, like a, almost a year, right? She's been out a long time. Has done live events and stuff. This but. is her big re- de- reintroduction. Can't see any noticeable difference in character or appearance. Oh, didn't like, you see the connection here? She was wearing Nakamura's red jacket. Oh, she was? Did not notice that. Mm. But, I mean, to be to have your first introduction in a year be kind of a punchline. Not necessarily the best look for her. Yep. And probably our last Jimmy Snuka subtle reference. I mean, JBL was putting him over pretty big. He's like... The recently, oh, that's uh, daughter of the recently deceased WWE Hall of Famer, Jimmy Snuka. Yeah, well, I don't think she will be Tamina Snuka on TV. Yeah, that would be my so guess. Uh, so in the middle of all this, the crowd starts chanting, we want Sasha. Yes. And, you know, going uh, coming out of Raw, I didn't even think about that, the fact that they were in Boston. And, right, and, right. You know, Sasha's hometown. So the crowd is chanting for Sasha, maybe thinking that everyone thought it was so obvious that Charlotte was coming that they'll change their mind. Uh, but they didn't because then Shane introduced Charlotte and Shane puts her over as possibly the biggest acquisition in the entire shakeup. She just walked out wearing her WrestleMania peacock outfit and the segment ended. Yep. So our division now has six women in it. I guess seven if you consider Nikki. Same as before. Yeah, yeah. Same it's, as before. It was just seeing everyone brought out. It really just put a spotlight, though, on yeah. it. Yeah. But, I mean, just simply with the addition of Sasha and, you know, also Tamina. I think uh, they provide two strong additions to the to I'm the glad roster. they didn't move Sasha. I think you yeah. can play out that Bailey feud. And I don't of, – of all the women that you think should be separated, Charlotte and Sasha even more so yes. than Sammy and Kevin Owens. Yes, yes, I yes. feel. Like those two being on separate shows – Make it mean something one day when you go back to that match, which yeah. should be a long, long way in the future. But, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of match quality. I feel like SmackDown now has, you know, Nat- Natalia, Becky, Charlotte, Tamina, all four girls who could really go. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go over it. I mean, this SmackDown roster looks pretty great coming mm-hmm. out of this. Then we got the graphic moves. Sin Cara is coming to SmackDown. Yes. I know one person noted to me about, well... Kalisto going was there to join the, the cruiserweight division, and yet they take Sin Cara. I never considered Sin Cara part of the cruiserweight division. Me and neither, even I, though they, they had him in there for a few matches. Yeah. yeah, he did a few, but was never, like, it does not matter where this guy is. Like, to be honest, if... Do you think that there's, I mean, they should be doing more with Sin Cara? Because, like, I feel like children still really identify with that, that whole package and that mask, you know? Like, I... I I don't know anymore, but like at some point, like I, I, I would overhear kids saying that Sin Cara was their favorite wrestler, and the guy hadn't been on TV in like months. Yet they somehow still liked him. He's still prominently featured in a lot, a lot of the cartoons. So could they still be? And had an entrance that people. I mean, it was a pretty spectacular entrance with the uh, the trampoline. Yeah. So could they be doing more with him? 
Maybe. They can't do less with him. Yeah. Unless they bring back Brawl for All, and I think he'd be the first one to sign up. <laughs> with the mask? Oh, yeah, with, Brawl the, for mask. with the mask. Well, wow. Hey, <laughs> if I you mean, can see out of one eye, you can yeah. do Brawl for All. I mean, Del Rio did it. Uh, so then uh, they announced Rusev as well, coming to SmackDown. Yeah, he's injured. Correct. He's hurt. Yeah, he's out for a few months with a shoulder sur- surgery he just had before WrestleMania. Aiden English is in the ring, still with the Vaude Villains video, though. He says he is bereft of any company and has a spotlight that shines on him and starts singing, which got some booze and was interrupted quickly by Ty Dillinger. And so it looks like English going right back to the NXT gimmick of singing. And also going right back to uh, obscurity. Quickly. Uh, Ty Dillinger did this cartwheel, did the 10 sign. English misses with a uh, knee drop. There's a flying forearm by Dillinger. Hit the tiebreaker. 221. Um, I guess the most notable thing was as the referee counted three, the crowd just chanted 10, 10, 10. I love that. Yes. I love that. I if only great. that um, – remember those those um, collect uh, – those yeah. call – what was yes. it? Uh, one, eight, uh, whatever. Like 10, 10, t- 2, 3, 10 or something. Something like that. <laughs> If this was 1999, he would be a marketing <laughs> dream for this wow. company. <laughs> to call collect. Anyway, uh, Dillinger wins and English is, I don't know. Just I mean, of, yeah, he's now got, he's a single vaudeville. He's got a job. He does. Which is good. There was a feature on AJ Styles and later they had ones on Corbin and Zayn ahead of the main event. And then getting her own coming soon spot was Lana who looks to be repackaged as, like, a cabaret dancer. Yeah, some type of dancer. She was just dancing on a chair. So my questions are, will he be? Will she be separated from Rusev? And also, will she still have her accent? Good questions. It would be, de- it would be awkward if she and Rusev were now separated, but that's what this felt like. This felt like she's going to be a wrestler. Hmm. I, I certainly do think there's a bit of a ceiling, you know, for for a manager, in that uh, maybe, you know, they probably see a lot more value to her as a single star, which I think they've wanted to push her as for a while now. No uh, reason you can't do both. Yeah, I would. Lo- I would Rusev ha- plays off her really well. Yeah, yeah. I would hate to see that association completely broken up. Yeah, and you have, I mean, you do have the total divas as a reason to keep them together. Yeah. Then there was a video for uh, – sorry, I was just about to repeat myself. Dolph Ziggler is then in the ring and says the big question is about him. He says he's staying here on SmackDown, which the audience booed. <laughs> he says the sh- it's the show he built and put on his back and made cool and says that with all of these roster moves, it's going to be exciting at first, but then each week after, it's going to be a little less important and exciting. <laughs> And True. eventually, you'll just be left with me. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. Is this guy like stealing like notes that we would have? <laughs> Shinsuke Nakamura interrupts. Huge reaction. Chant for Nakamura. And Ziggler says he doesn't know who he is. So the crowd chants his name and then start hum- they hum his theme. Nakamura takes the microphone and just says that he is Shinsuke Nakamura. Ziggler goes for a kick, is caught and dumped on his ass, and Ziggler just retreats to the floor. And Dolph Ziggler literally has been put into the Miz's body yeah. to take up his feud to the point that on Talking Smack, yeah. Renee noted that Nakamura has now interrupted you twice. Yeah. They just like like retconned Dolph Ziggler into the Miz's. Uh, yeah, he's role. now he's now Miz, Miz Ziggler. Mizgler. Mizgler. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he had a match with John Cena at WrestleMania with Maurice. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting to, for me to see how they promote Shinsuke Nakamura because um, they're track like they have no real track record of promoting uh, uh, you know strong baby faces with a limited ability to speak English. Um, but here, like the crowd, cut basically. Did all the work for for Nakamura. He came out, didn't even say a word. Crowd just continued to chant his name. And all Nakamura had to do was grab the mic and just say his name. And the rest was all body language, which, which of course he's you know probably the best at. So it's really interesting. I have to wonder that they're you know they must be trying to figure things out themselves 
too uh, uh, for, for 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 ideas on how to push this guy without scripting him. This is going to test that team because yeah. I would say this it's is going to test Vince McMahon. This is not a hundred percent on WWE. Of course, Nakamura has to do his part, but I would say this is like seventy five percent on because this guy on night one is one of your most over guys on either roster, mm-hmm. much like he was when he first showed up at NXT. And six months into NXT, he was a lot less over than he was when he debuted. And to say this guy is not charismatic, that this guy doesn't jump through the screen, that you cannot market the hell out of this guy, is insanity. So sure. you have to think out of the box with him. And that's yeah. something that they don't always do mm-hmm. well with. This week I thought was, you know, again, a, a good segment. They had to kind of redo essentially last week's segment um, <laughs> to draw the association with Ziggler, I guess. But this week, I feel like I feel like I was ready for him to do something a little more physical, some type of you know. And he did a little bit. He didn't dropped him. Yeah, I didn't really lay his tripped hands. Him. Tripped him. But I was ready to see a Kinshasa. You know what I mean? And uh, and I think if they do continue next week, uh, which of course they will, but if they they have another another interaction with Dolph next week, I think it's time for him to, get, to actually get physical because it's been it'll have been three weeks by next week. Yeah, this is actually one of those programs that I think you would want to see at Payback, but the next SmackDown pay per view is until May twenty first, mm. and I don't know if they're going to hold off on it that long. I wouldn't even necessarily do a match next week. I want to keep that special, promote that a week in advance. But some type of physical interaction, especially for a guy who doesn't say much, I think is necessary. And from those that were there in the building last week, uh, they said they had a very good dark match together last week. uh, Dolphin Nakamura. Nakamura. Cool. Uh, Then we got another coming soon video. This one for, as expected, The New Day coming to SmackDown. And given that this was a two-hour show, you couldn't cram everyone onto this show. So I think it was smart to space these out. Do we also know how long Kofi will be out? Just a few weeks. So is it more worthwhile for them to debut him when Kofi's ready? Yeah, I I would. It did say coming soon, didn't say next week. No, and you don't have to bring that. If Kofi is only out till the end of this month, yeah, yeah, just wait. Mm -hmm. This show is already most weeks crammed with guys, and now the roster feels bloated on SmackDown for a two-hour show. Mm -hmm. Um, There's going to be a lot of those weeks where I I think certain key guys may not even be on the show. Mm -hmm. Like you have a really big roster now on SmackDown. TJ Perkins, though, did have time on this show and got to plug 205 Live in the best or worst uh, 205 Live promo to date. He says, Every- uh, I feel like he had another one to come that might have topped this one. He says everyone's been sleeping on him except for Neville, but says he dropped that loser weight, Austin Aries, and he calls Jack Gallagher a circus freak. Anyway... <laughs> This wasn't even the worst promo he had. Like the one, the, night. the one afterwards was way worse. And again, I don't really fault him. Certainly, you know, the, he he has a lot to work on in terms of delivery. But I don't know who's writing this shit. I don't know who's writing this for him. He should be an inner monologue guy, <laughs> like just wandering. Oh, the like streets. what we wanted for Jeff Hardy. Yeah, yeah. I think but what Jeff Hardy did. Yeah, what Jeff Hardy I, did. I, 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 <laughs> not not what we wanted. Yeah. The shit we joked about that actually <laughs> happened. I kept I, I was thinking that maybe we it was just a stupid fantasy idea we joked about on the show, but they actually did that with Jeff Hardy on Impact. Yeah, you could hear his thoughts. Mm. AJ Styles, Baron Corbin, Sami Zayn was the main event. A uh, really great main event, I thought. Mm. Um Corbin clotheslined Styles to the floor and then sent Styles uh Styles and Zayn sent Corbin out so they worked together. Um these two certainly uh could have some great matches together down yeah. the road. Um, Zayn went for his uh, Topicon hero, but Corbin pulled him to the floor first, throwing him into the ramp. Zayn hit a split-legged moonsault to both. After the break, Corbin is in control for a long time until Zayn sends Styles to the floor. An exploder is hit to Corbin, and then he sets up for the Haluva kick, but runs into an Ushigoroshi by Styles. Corbin then drops Styles with this big clothesline. Corbin slid to the floor, ran around right into a knee from the apron by Styles. Uh, then Zayn hit a blue thunder bomb, getting a two count on AJ. Corbin took Zayn on his shoulders, and Styles dives off the top for a forearm, but Zayn avoids it with a victory roll to Corbin for a two count, which was uh, an old Steiner Brothers spot. Corbin then hit a deep six to Zayn. Styles made the save. Corbin then ran shoulder first into the post, and. Styles hit an Inziguri and a springboard 450. Zayn made the save on this occasion. And then the finish saw Styles clash blocked by Zayn. 
Haluva kicks sends Corbin to the floor, but Zayn turns around and gets hit with the phenomenal forearm, and AJ wins the match 16 minutes and 43 seconds, and he is now the number one contender for the winner of Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho a month from now. Mm-hmm. Really fun match. A lot of just some incredible timing for a lot of their three way sequences. Um, I think Styles is definitely the right guy. Uh, I hope they keep Zayn and Corbin strong because I think, I mean, Zayn obviously was great, but I thought Corbin looked good too, here too. Yeah, and I mean, on SmackDown especially, like you, you might get some really great main events most weeks, is what I, I would assume. Uh, now, I wanted to do a quick game for you, Way. Okay. I'm going to read. The talent that moved. Yeah. And I want you to say winner or loser okay. with this you move. Should, you should join in too. Okay. Kevin Owens. Winner. I'll agree on that one. Sami Zayn. Winner. Perhaps the biggest of all of them. Yes. I'll agree. The Shining Stars. I'll say winners. Yeah. Jinder Mahal. I'd say winner too. Simply uh, based off of uh, his Talking Smack appearance, which I thought was very strong. Charlotte. Um, I think the jury's out on that one. She was in a really featured role on Raw. Yeah, I would say it's... It, I don't think she necessarily loses by being on SmackDown. If anything, I feel like she has more women to work with on SmackDown. She was positioned as, like, the big get as well. Yeah, so I, I, I can't say it was a, it's win or lose. Um, Yeah, to me and I think by default, you have yeah. to just say, uh, no, I don't think it really matters. I think anybody on going to SmackDown, save for the New Day... Save for the new day. Um, I would even say Rusev. I feel like everybody going to SmackDown except for the new day are probably going to benefit from being on SmackDown. I will you know? say with Rusev, I don't know because in just looking here at, at the heels, okay, mm-hmm. Rusev's going to find himself behind Owens, Corbin, and Z- uh, I guess it's co- that, I guess that it's means comparable. he's prime for that spot. Yeah, for that top spot. Because you're right. Because on on Raw. You've got Strowman, Bray Wyatt, Samoa Joe, and he's even below The Miz. Yes, it's it's a less bloated roster with less superstar names and a lot more opportunity for growth. And also, really, having Talking Smack is a huge benefit to a lot of these guys who haven't had necessarily great, you know, the scripted performances on Raw. The only reason I say why the New Day aren't necessarily winners coming out of this is because, I mean, they were heavily featured on Raw it feels like a show more suited for kind of doing that talking, uh, you know, comedy, no, they, comedy they gimmick. Like SmackDown is a very heavy show now that having those five, eight minute promos in the ring, I don't think that's going to happen most weeks for New Day. Yeah. But in terms of in ring, it could be a benefit to them. That's another tag team who could have great matches with, with the Usos or Alpha, you know, or even the Shining Stars. I, I wonder if it was. If you could look at this as a eventually Biggie breaks off from this group, because I think that's ultimately where you have to get to. Perhaps. Even though these guys are huge merchandise sellers why together. Not, why can't you promote Big, Biggie as a single star while, while You could do that. Keep, keep that association. Um, okay. Yeah. Now on Raw, I think okay. we have some losers to pick from. Uh, two of the biggest, I think, are Miz and Maurice. I think they're going to have a much lesser role on Raw. I agree. Dean Ambrose. Oh. <sighs> I think uh, moving him, just it depends on the follow up. Uh, but I would say a move is positive for Dean Ambrose, if, uh, if only because it'll facilitate some type of change for him. You want to hear? This is crazy. On the babyface side of Raw, you have Reigns, Rollins, Balor, Jericho for at least a bit. The Hardys. Oh, so, so you have the whole um, the Shield. You have the Shield on on Raw. The entire Shield is mm-hmm. on Raw. Yeah, as it, baby faces. Yes. Yeah. And when you look at these baby faces compared to heels, I think that there is definitely. The need to turn someone. And that someone to me would be Ambrose. Well, I think that someone is already Roman Reigns. I, I wouldn't even necessarily classify Reigns as a babyface right now. Yeah, I guess it's – he's presented as one but received as another. So I guess you could argue what Reigns and Strowman's but roles yeah, are. Yeah, I would definitely uh, turn Dean Ambrose as well. Yeah, because if not, he's going to be in the identical spot on Raw as he was on SmackDown. Yeah. Uh, Apollo Crews? Uh, I'm going to say loser. Like, I feel like SmackDown is a better environment for a guy like that. And, you know, the thing is, he didn't he didn't even receive the attention that he probably should have had then. Uh, he's another guy who really needs to get his personality out there and, and demonstrate and get his story out there. So, But I don't necessarily see him getting a better chance of that happening on Raw than SmackDown. I'm going to skip Hawkins. Um, Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt? 
I would I would say lateral, you know. The thing is, like, I don't know if how much of this is like simply based on my my perception of Raw versus SmackDown. To me, I think anybody moving to SmackDown just has a much better opportunity for growth. But uh, for the talent that are ready for kind of that more busier landscape, like an Alexa Bliss, I think that's a win. Uh, Kalisto, I think win win, yeah, for two hundred five, yeah. Uh, he Slater and Rhino. Uh, I, I think they'll be just as forgotten on Raw as they were on yes. SmackDown towards the end. Mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned Bliss, uh, Mickey James. I think it's a win, yeah, definitely, because uh, you know I think that's a win for the division. I yes. don't think she's going to be one of the main. Uh, people f- pushed in that division, but she can have a lot of good matches yeah. with the, the different women there. And oh, with Bailey, with Sasha. Oh, with, she's going to be on Nia duty, maybe. Which I yeah. don't know if there's going to be too many arms in the air for that one after Monday. Mm. All right, well, that's uh, all the talent that moved over the uh, the last couple of days. And from SmackDown, we are now going to go to. Oh, damn, I closed my. Talking notes. Smack. Talking Smack, with Renee Young, Daniel Bryan. And Shane McMahon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shane was fine on this show. Shane was fine. Because- Much different when you have the three as opposed to just Renee and yeah. Shane. I don't think I would have watched this if it was Renee and Shane. <laughs> oh, really? I'm serious. I hated last well, week. Well, something like you definitely get from a Daniel Bryan uh, presence on this show is just a, a more fun vibe, a more fun atmosphere. Because Bryan just like oh, – just. He he treats it like like he he's actually having fun, you know, like it's a party. When he's the life of the party, and when Brian leaves, you're stuck there with um, the the coworker that you invited just to be nice, but don't necessarily only want to hang out with by yourself. They they panned over to Shane, and Shane immediately starts doing the yes chant. I cannot say this a hundred percent, but I. I would be 99% sure if I were ever to privately talk to Daniel Bryan, I bet you he fucking hates this thing. Just hates it. Oh. Like the look well. he had of like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure he's tired of it. Sure. Like I'm sure he's he – Okay, feels- okay, okay. The better question is if you were to talk to 2003, 2004 Ring of Honor Daniel Bryan – and showed him a video clip of, of this guy doing this yes chant, what would that Daniel Bryan say? But it's a very different person, you know, like he's doing this, the whole yes thing, it's not necessarily, you know, amazing for the hardcore crowd, but it's great for the children, you know, and that's that's the audience that he plays to these days. It, listen, Daniel Bryan is probably a guy that has changed as radically as anyone. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I remember talking to this guy, and he wouldn't even speak out of character because of what he believed in wrestling. I mean, there's a story of when he was in Memphis, and they wanted to do... Um, he was a heel, and he was going to have to do a spot where he, like, cheats during the match. And his explanation was, I don't agree with the philosophy of heels cheating. You know what? Like, this guy had a really— what, 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 Do you remember his justification for that? What, is, like, what did he mean? Yeah, I, I mean, he never expanded upon it. But that was just oh, okay. a story from, like, when, when he was down, like, in Memphis, I believe it was. So, I mean, this guy had a really— strict view of professional wrestling and his idea of it which i remember another interview i did with him out of character where he explained that wrestling is like a box and it's for him at that time this was like 2009 i want to say that it was trying to get out of that box and and play around in the area outside of the box that has restricted wrestling okay so i mean this is someone that i think if you were to chart kind of his philosophical differences they'd be pretty astounding to see where his Mm -hmm. his attitude has has gone towards wrestling and what makes a successful character i bet Mm -hmm. you the 2002 daniel bryan would mock this version and this one would probably do the same to the 2002 version Mm. That got very deep quickly. Um, <laughs> so Brian said that this show is going to be much more peaceful without the Miz and Maurice, and lists off all the names that they gained and the ones that left. Dolph Ziggler is the first guest, and he shows up eating an apple. He just wanted to piss me off here. I was almost going to fast forward to this. I will not listen to a man that is fucking eating as he is doing an interview. But thankfully, he wasn't taking bites out of this thing. But I swear uh, to God. A, he, had, he had a mouthful when he started. He it. did when he started. Like, I was seriously not going to watch this. Like, there's few things I can't stand, like listening to someone who's chewing. It, it, I, it, I mean, Aries also has that gimmick now. 
but doesn't isn't eating it mm. while he's talking. He holds it and then will take a bite at the end of it. Right. He says that he requested Dean Ambrose leave. Uh, and this followed Renee telling Shane and Brian she was not happy about one of the roster moves. Yeah, this also comes uh, – uh, is also very relevant coming off of the episode of Total Divas. Yes. Where um, the Total Divas that uh, premiered last week was uh, an episode that was centered around the initial draft. And everybody was very nervous that uh, their significant others would be drafted to another show because I don't know if you realize, but with their travel schedules, they would only overlap at home for one day yeah. out of the week. Yeah. And so essentially, if you were married or dating somebody, you would only get to see that person one day a week. And Renee was terrified. In fact, she was like contemplating looking for other work. You know, quitting, quitting the job if she had to be separated from Dean. So uh, with that happening now, I'm sure, you know, uh, we can also talk about the marriage as well. Yeah, which she to be married. honest, I, I didn't even – I wasn't even going to bring it up unless um, she, she did. Up. She, she confirmed it. Yeah. But listen, I, I don't know what the deal was. If, if Owens was seriously just doing that to get under her skin, I think that was such a shit move. No. Yeah. She was wearing a ring. She but, was wearing a but, ring. Yeah, yeah. But sure, it's like a dick right. thing to do. Yeah, 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 of course. But she's confirmed it. So. She's confirmed it. She's married. And uh, I have to wonder, like, how how far in advance this was planned or if this split facilitated it. They do live in Vegas, you know? Yeah. I mean, all I can say is, like, when I got a bunch of names a while back, Ambrose was not one that was listed. But there were a bunch of names that ended up moving that uh, were not in that list. But again, it just shows you like how how life-changing some of this stuff can be when you're changing uh, members of the roster from place to place. And possibly getting this news uh, a day or two after you got married. Yeah. Like well, the, Ambrose may not have found out till Monday he was uh, going to Raw. I w- I'm I'm saying I wonder if they got married because they found out about the split. If they weren't going to see each other, you know, uh, if, ex- except for one once a week, you want the, a bit of that assurance, don't you? Yeah. I mean, it's I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. This is kind of the um, the episode of a Total Divas also dealt heavily with uh, Paige and Del Rio, uh, or at least Paige's reaction to being split from Alberto Del Rio, and uh, she she was drafted to Raw and he was drafted to SmackDown. And you remember this that was basically Alberto's last day. Yeah, and uh, they ended up breaking up as a result of it, and that's sort of the cliffhanger coming out of that episode. It was a good episode of SmackDown or, or Total Divas. Anyway, so, Ziggler continued by. Stating that um, he requested that Ambrose leave the show and says he's a big fan of the Shining Stars. He's glad they're on the show. Doesn't really know Shinsuke Nakamura because I follow our product. He doesn't watch NXT, obviously. No, clearly not. Yeah. Uh, Renee says that Nakamura has now interrupted Dolph twice. Ziggler says that you should have to pay to see the match between the two of them clearly doesn't follow the WWE's uh, network model either of how easy it is to watch their pay-per-views for free. Uh, He says, this isn't Orlando. This isn't Japan. (laughs) This is New York. And Renee corrects him, stating this is Boston. And Ziggler clearly biting his tongue uh, and stating that is an old term that Daniel Bryan would understand, which... Or Shane. (laughs) To Renee's defense, it's a stupid classification but it is what the wwf e is always characterized new york even though not on tv though they've never no it's not an on-screen term that uh most would know but i mean it is kind of dumb like why why is the it makes no sense yeah but anyway it's like saying boston's new york uh sure brian says that brie is due in two and a half weeks and then shane and brian compare their shoes and Ziggler leaves, and he offers to fill in on Talking Smack anytime that someone's away. Yeah, I love that that like, when they when they compared shoes. <laughs> so Shane like brings up and shows off his kicks, and Daniel Bryan shows off his shoes, and of made course, out of recycled tires. Yeah, of course it's something like. And Shane's was probably made for people making three cents an hour. Uh, perhaps yes, but of course Daniel Bryan has to have vegan shoes or like recycled tired shoes. Yeah, and Ziggler said, you know, I was gonna make a joke, but. It's probably a really worthwhile charity that is attached to that, so I'm not going to put my foot in my mouth. Brian mentions rooming with Nakamura and Lyoto Machida 
at the New Japan Dojo in Santa Monica, California in the early 2000s and talks about Nakamura leaving New Japan to take a huge risk to come here and uh, probably did more to give people background on this guy than anything on the show. He beautifully narrated um, Nakamura's story and I I hope – I just like – I know Dan O'Brien. Like I don't know how long he, he plans on being around professional wrestling but – I wish he was a commentator on SmackDown. The amount of great work. Well, they, they could have done that move. Yeah, they really could have, of course. But yeah. he's probably going to disappear for some time. Yeah, the amount of benefit, though, he'd give to guys like a Shinsuke Nakamura, you know, uh, to anybody. Like, he is able to to just fill out their story so well for an Apollo Crews, you know. He did it so well in, in the Cruiserweight Classic, and I, I have no doubt he would have provided the same on SmackDown. Completely... Not even touching on like the the whole Moro story and everything. Like that SmackDown announced team is so much worse now. Yeah. And you look at the idea if it were Tom, Brian, and Gray uh I guess Graves isn't an option at this point. Phillips and Brian at this point. Oh, of course. Like it's yeah. just I mean I and I it's a very ineffective I, team. I, I can't moment. even hate on like Tom Phillips that much, you know? Like he's I, he's, he's fine. fine. He's fine. But uh yeah, anyway. Jinder Mahal was then on the show. He says immediately he has the best physique in WWE and he is also the most improved. And says no one diets like him. He blamed Rob Gronkowski for him losing the Battle Royal at WrestleMania and his loss on his SmackDown debut. He wants him banned from all WWE live events. And he wants people to forget the old Jinder Mahal. No one is out training me or out dieting me. He doesn't even know what a cheat meal is. And he needs to become a champion. He's been hit with the word potential since being signed in 2009. And now he's going to live up to it. And that was it. Yeah, I like Jinder a lot here. Um, I, I thought he had a lot of intensity here, talking about his diet, talking about the potential that he was supposed to have but never realized and that he really wants to take now that he's on SmackDown. He justified. So, like, they're, they're actually tra- talking about, like, when they're talking about why Gronkowski should be uh, banned from ringside, uh, Shane's like, you know, going back and forth, like, well, you did provoke him. You did take his beer. And then Jinder's like, I was thirsty. I love that. It's, it's, it's hilarious. And I think, um, I think uh, he had a really good showing here. And I think of all the guys that they've come back to basically be jobbers, like a Kurt Hawkins, I feel like Jinder actually has coming off off of that battle roll really like stood out and so uh, i look forward to seeing more with him so you're saying smackdown you don't feel will hinder gender yeah mahal leaves and brian says everyone's talking about his physique but he's also improved a lot in the ring which i'm not gonna necessarily disagree with daniel bryan uh, but let's let's choose our weeks yeah maybe a bad maybe bad time bad on time that one for that Kevin Owens is the last one to come in, and immediately he throws his shoes onto the table. Everyone was confused, and he said, oh, I thought we were all comparing shoes. These are mine. And then he goes to congratulate Renee, and Shane just says, yeah, we're not, we're not talking about that, and we just moved on. It definitely felt like a line that Owens inserted. And Oh, yeah, for sure. If it was cleared with Renee ahead of time, cool. But if not, I just think a dick move, like just a real well, dick thing. Yeah. If they didn't want to talk about it, yeah. then they didn't want to talk about it. And anyway. he's a dick, though. Well, but yeah. Listen, beyond that, Owens was beyond fantastic in this segment. He feels like the number one heel in this company. Mm -hmm. Natural heel. Yeah. Um, He congratulates Renee. uh, Sorry, I said that. And then Owens brings up the fact that Brian and Shane never drafted him last summer. And Shane says, well, your attitude wasn't that great. And Owens says, yeah, well, what's changed? What's made you want me now? What's, What's changed? He says, we don't have to get along, but I am bitter about not being drafted, and I'm very pissed that you brought Sami Zayn over. And this was all passive aggressiveness, which maybe is the best Kevin Owens trait. And (laughs) Owens says, as U.S. champion, it makes him better than everyone else on this show. He then ends it by stating simply, Shane, could I get my shoe, please? And then just calmly congratulates Brian on his upcoming baby. Says, yeah, yeah, I've got a... I've got a child. I've got two, actually. One's about to turn three, and one's about to turn uh, nine. So uh, it's great, and uh, thank you for uh, not drafting me so I couldn't provide for them. Goodbye. 
yeah. this was awesome. Like Owens is oh, just, at a level few are at as a as a talker, oh. as a personality. Like he feels like he will be the guy to this show will be featured around. And you have opponents in AJ, which they've set up down the road with Nakamura. Yeah. Zayn, you could always go back to. I mean, it just feels it's endless for this guy on this show. And oh. talking smack, this guy will be must see on this show whenever he appears. I'd love for him to host one day. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, so, I mean, again, like the move to SmackDown doesn't just come with, uh, you know, a move to that program. It comes with the move to Talking Smack, which I think is, you know, uh, to me, like uh, the the bigger draw of of anything. And somebody like a Kevin Owens or a Sami Zayn are in Talking Smack. To me, I'm like, I'm salivating at at, at the idea of of the benefit of some of of that show to a lot of these guys. Uh, Owens, you know, I think probably already a big fan of Talking Smack from the sounds of it. He probably watches it and probably has thought a lot about how he would portray himself on the show. And I think it shows. Like, he's per- – I mean, he's so natural in this environment. He basically came in and I think shut the rest of the panel up, um, whether or not uh, intentional. But it made for some interesting TV. I just – I look f- – it's sad to, d- to lose The Miz, who I think really – took advantage of this environment and was actually just ah, shockingly good in this environment. But I'm very glad to get Kevin Owens and some of the others on Talking Smack. And then we had 205 Live. Uh, just a show. Really good main event. I'll yeah. say that. It started with Brian Kendrick and Mustafa Ali. Uh, they went nine minutes here. Drew Gulak was shown throughout watching backstage on his phone. I don't know who it was, but... They must have had a great plan. Uh, Kendrick attacked him by hiding under the ring and then coming out the other side and pulling his arm into the post. Then he kicked the rope into the mouth of Ali. Ali blocked a captain's hook attempt. And then uh, an Inziguri from the apron rolled into his neck breaker. Kendrick runs into a knee in the corner. Ali goes to the top. Kendrick knocks him off balance, applies the captain's hook. He's right by the rope, but then the bell rings without Charles Robinson calling for it. And Akira Tozawa is incognito here, uh, all in black with a hat on, and he rang the bell. So the match continues. Ali hits the inverted 450 and wins the match as Tozawa has the same security hat that Kendrick wore a few weeks ago and says, lesson number two, appearance can be deceiving. And then does his chant for the audience. So these were these all the same lessons that Kendrick did weeks ago? I don't think so. Oh, they're nude? I don't know. And did you recall the hat immediately? Yeah. I mean, no. I needed it explained because I, I'm not storing any part of these lessons in like, my head. But Kendrick did attack him in a security outfit. Yeah, but I don't even remember that. And I've watched every single episode of, of Tuesday. Well, it definitely happened. But the thing is, like, they're, they're doing these, like, long kind of drawn-out storylines, which I, you would usually applaud. But I feel like for 205 Live, I don't remember f- the shit. Like, Tazawa takes out the hat and says, Kendrick, you remember this? And I'm searching in my head, thinking about what the fuck he's talking about. And I, I, I okay, I, it was a security thing that Kendrick did. So I wonder if even like these lessons are like he, Tozawa doing the same lessons to Kendrick. But how the fuck is anyone supposed to remember <laughs> what Brian Kendrick said in a lesson a month ago, and on a two episode of Two Hundred Five Live? So, okay, anyway. I when you said about Perkins about not even being the best one. I was blanking on what you were talking about, and as I look at my notes... Dude, you forgot I, this TJ Perkins interview that's coming up? Oh, my God. Uh, now I don't. Dasha is with TJ. Oh. They recap the Aries attack with Dasha asking TJ about it, and TJ Perkins <laughs> said these words <laughs> on a broadcast out loud. Au contraire, mon frère. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> maybe him and Kevin Owens are both gearing up for the same kind of uh, presentation <laughs> with their language skills. He says he wants to play Neville's advocate. <sighs> Neville's advocate. Neville's advocate. I, I mean, that could be that could be the basis of this entire heel turn. What a, f- uh, a funny a pun? pun? Yeah. Oh, he could do Neville. Sounds like devil. We can have him be Neville's advocate. Let's turn him heel. 
He said, I went into the lion's den of the CWC, and it was like playing tennis with the net down. <laughs> Is that a saying? I don't know. Has that ever been used? You can't play tennis with a net down. Um, I guess you can. Like, if you really want Playing it. hockey without the goalie in net? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this was brutal. <laughs> ah. Au contraire, mon frère. <laughs> Jack Allard comes in. <laughs> And oh, God. Yeah, there was more. There, there was, was more. more of this. Oh, God. He wants him to take a more gentlemanly approach, and Perkins does Gallagher's accent calling him Mr. Peanut while Let, mimicking the voice. Listen here, Mr. Peanut. And he proceeds with a, his attempt at a British accent. Listen. Which was probably offensive to most British viewers. A heel turn was much needed for TJ Perkins. I'm totally in favor of that. I think it's already paid dividends in his match. But these lines just make him look like such uh, an even bigger dork than he than him doing all the video game puns and all that shit. Who's who's writing this? Is he doing it? Is he writing it himself? Au contraire, mon frère. <laughs> like what the fuck? Let me play devil's out. Av- Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but like. Here he is, you know, he turned heel. Now I'm waiting for him to have this, like, new dickish attitude. Um, and speaking, like, you know, this guy who's really kind of, like, a bit more of a badass, a bit cooler. Yet, like, this was the farthest thing I could have imagined from that. Then we got a recap of Swan admitting to buying all the gifts for Alicia Fox. And he took on Johnny Ocean, who received chance of We Don't Know You. Really testing how many people could we drive off this late in the tapings in a major market like Boston. I mean, I guess they, they also didn't announce him. No. Either. Uh, the announcers identified him, but not the... Did, did the announce Or like the... The, 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 the like, commentators. Like Phillips thing. and Graves yeah, yeah. called him Johnny Ocean. Phillips compares Ocean to and is yelling to Joe Pesci in Home Alone. Graves mentions Mariah Carey and Janet Jackson and their recent breakups. And this week, they can't have Dar and Fox be added to the list. There was a double foot stomp to the back of Ocean, splash off the ropes, a spinning wheel kick, and Phoenix splash. Swan won in 2.15. And then says he told them the truth about the gifts and goes to explain why. But that will have to wait because Noam Dar interrupted and he took credit for all of the gifts. Dar calls him a dirty liar and asks what kind of a man interferes in another man's relationship. Which I get every week is supposed to be the, um, he's playing uh, this hypocrite. Nobody remembers the Cedric Alexander stuff. Nobody. Nobody registers that to get the hypocrisy across. Uh, the- that is a distant memory on 205 Live when Cedric Alexander and Alicia Fox were together. Right. So, anyway. Was that, sorry, was there a line here that referenced? Yeah, there? Dar said, What kind of a man interferes in another man's relationship? Oh, okay. So he's supposed to be a hypocrite. Right. Alicia comes out. She says, Of course, I believe Dar, and calls Swan a liar doing her Alicia Fox acting at her its height. But it has noticed Swan looking at her. Another gift gets delivered, and Dar intercepts the box and says, this is from me, and sends Swan away. Fox opens the box, and apparently Rich Swan got a hold of anthrax, <laughs> and Alicia Fox could be in critical condition as we speak. It could have been a box of cocaine. It just this white powder exploded all over her as Noam Dar had taken credit for this gift, and clearly it was not his gift. Mm -hmm. So he was exposed. Yeah. So it wasn't the positive uh, HIV test that I was assuming that that would have would have happened uh, would have been the gift. Maybe that's for two hundred five live. That's a go more edgy storylines. Yeah. So that wasn't necessarily the the swerve, but this was indeed the payoff over a month in the making, and. You know, when it finally got here, it turned out fine, turned out well, um, and I guess we'll get a match coming out of this. But uh, I, I don't really – for 205 Live, my expectations are so low that I really thought this was fine. I have no issues with it. I just – I don't know how – I'm amazed that this did as well as it did this late into the show. You know what I mean? This is a, a prelim, pre-Smackdown type of show, type of storyline at best. Maybe Alicia Fox is going to turn the tables and she is going to reply to the sender to announce she's pregnant. 
Huh. And then Noam Dar is going to be like, whoa, whoa, I didn't send those gifts. You can't get pregnant off of gifts, though. Suspension of disbelief way. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. So then Dosh is with, I, I hate this storyline, by the way. I think it's the worst. I think it's worse than Tozawa and Kendrick. <laughs> I, uh, There's I, a lot I, of I candidates would... from 205 Live. Yeah. Dosh is with Austin Aries. Says Perkins is showing a lack of judgment as evidenced by the fact he dabs in 2017. And says Neville wants a puppet, a puppet to serve as a buffer before Aries can get to him at payback. And then at the end, Aries dabs and takes a bite out of his banana. Yeah. I, I mean, um, I wonder if the same people writing a TJ Perkins promo are the same that are writing Austin Aries promos. Because, like, this didn't, this wasn't corny at all. Like, Aries came across, like, really cool, as he usually does. And, of course, he has much better delivery than TJ Perkins. But even just reading the script, I mean, this is not filled with puns and corny, corny sayings. Could, how, how could it be different? How could it be so different? Like, Why? Au contraire. <laughs> Main oh, event yeah. was Jack Gallagher and TJ Perkins with Neville watching in the back. Uh, Perkins set out to attack the knee of Gallagher. Um, and this <laughs> featured a – what was it so I'm funny? I'm just laughing at it. <laughs> Au contraire, mon frere. <laughs> Awful line. <laughs> Loser weight. Perkins used a figure four setup into a sharpshooter, uh, breaking down the knee – Perkins ties him up with uh, the leg and forces him into this uh, figure four with these underhooks applied as well. Gallagher gets out, attacks him with some uppercuts. Gallagher then placed him on the top and hit this huge belly-to-back suplex with Perkins' head just crashing into the mat upon landing. And then Perkins rolls to the floor, comes back, applies a knee bar, but Gallagher rolls to make the rope. Gallagher then spins him into a backbreaker onto the injured knee w- with using that. Perkins goes for a wrecking ball drop kick to the apron, but Gallagher catches him with the ring skirt and headbutts him in the chest, gets a two count from that, and then Perkins sends Gallagher headfirst into the post and hit the detonation kick to pin him in 15 minutes and 30 seconds. At the entranceway, Neville came out to raise oh Perkins' arm. And that ended Sorry, the show. I'm still laughing at <laughs> At old country, <laughs> what was his reaction? You think when he saw his script for two o five live? Do you remember the uh, the Evan Bourne interview we talked about recently that I did? Yeah, that's probably <laughs> among the the reactions. Oh man, had. poor guy. Yeah, yeah. Listen, Mister Peanut, <laughs> poor guy. Okay, with all that said, I mean, in ring he's still amazing. This man. this main event was great. Oh, I thought this, this was a credit this late in the God. show. I thought SmackDown and Two Hundred Five Live had great main events. I thought this match was was so good, and uh, it's it's interesting and a lot of fun to see TJ Perkins work a heel style, doing a lot more grounded based uh, submission offense, which he is fantastic at. Like he can make that knee bar look so dangerous, and he's just like very aggressive and violent with a lot of his ground attacks that. Uh, it actually is is a lot of fun to watch him uh, work as a heel. He now dabs, but gets does it, the right. He does is, it does it as a he heel? is seeking the reaction that everyone gives him for dabbing. Does it as a heel taunt? And this was something that I, I guess was established earlier with the Aries line in his promo. Um, so it, it see he could be a character that is intentionally trying to attract goofy X Pac heat. Like wow, you're so lame. I have to boo you. Au contraire, mon frere, the biggest heat, he, uh, heel line, maybe. But, uh, you know, the heel turn is definitely an improvement uh, as far as the match goes. I think uh, the crowds, we're able to pay a bit more attention to him now, now that he, now that we want to boo this guy actively. Uh, it allows him to play more of an aggressor in the match. And, uh, yeah, I thought the match was just really good. In the middle of all this, I don't know if you noticed, John, there started to become uh, you could hear a faint chant of this is boring but it was quickly follow- followed up by another louder group thankfully chanting no it's not oh. so there was a dueling chant of this is boring and no it's not So I mean if you're watching the match the match was fucking awesome so the only reason you were, that you would have found it boring was probably because you weren't paying attention or you didn't like the characters but the match itself was great and it was, it was nice to see that that reaction to a this is boring chant from most of the crowd. Man, if that takes off, I can't wait for a this is awesome to be countered with that. This is awesome. No, it's not. 
Oh, I can't wait for that either. But a really great match. Yeah, I think both main events were solid on SmackDown and 205 Live this week. So a lot of moves, lots of news coming out of these shows. And yeah, I think that uh, you got to see the best and worst of 205 Live Yeah, on Tuesday. Okay, uh, we're not going to go through all of this feedback. This show has already gone a, uh, a sizable chunk already. Um, we'll just pick out a few here. Uh, Jeremy. What do you guys think of the idea of Kalisto and Apollo Crews as a tag team? They may not be good at promos, but their in-ring talent is amazing, and they could have some great matches with the Revival and the Hardys. Well, they, it- they've definitely drawn up that association. They, they are shown to be friends. Uh, I think it could be fine, but you, you, know, you, rely, you just kind of need a mouthpiece, you know, and, and you'd have to essentially rely on Crews because I don't necessarily expect Kalisto to, to provide. Call uh, it um, tag movies. team stuff. <laughs> tag team things? Tag team things. Yeah. But really, the team I want to see is Cruz and Tazawa. You know? I think those guys, I mean, I, I'm sure they're all friends, but like, I, I, I've seen some videos of like Tazawa and, and Cruz together, and I think they, they're, they have a ton of great chemistry on screen. What if we just threw out this, this stupid 205 limit and just put Apollo Cruz on 205 Live? He's the one giant Fuck. on the show. That'd be awesome. Dude, he could work this style with all these guys. Of course he And could. you have one guy that's the giant on the show. That'd be awesome. Well, maybe like, could he cut down to 205 like like in kayfabe could you buy that like apollo cruz oh you could lie about anybody i don't think any there, there's going to be very few that are what, gonna, what what's his build weight I, I couldn't tell you i don't know i never pay attention to build weight i would cause. love to see like the you know a storyline of somebody cutting all the way down like a heavyweight cutting all the way down to 205 oh and then he gets onto the scale and he's got to hold onto the towel and he just makes sure. it sure yeah what's his build weight what's 109 kilograms i don't know oh, fuck Whatever. Uh, but yeah, like, t- uh, Cruz on 205 Live I think would be awesome. Yeah, there's just a ton of fun matches he could have. Yeah. Anyway, uh, okay, we go to... 240. <laughs> that's a bit of a... Hey, man, that's that's probably what, like... Cormier? You think Cormier cuts from two? Cormier? No oh, way. I actually know what he started his camp at, and it was... Uh, I can give you the, the number in a minute, because I just wrote it. But Whatever, you make a long-term storyline. Okay, have him slim down a little... Sure. Uh, show his diet. <laughs> and then show him in the sauna. Some great vignettes. Boom. Kalisto could be coaching him with Tozawa. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Mark from Vaughn. Nice sign that Nakamura got such a huge reaction from a non-mania crowd. Not a fan of the tired direction they're taking Kale and his talking smack appearance was mostly awkward. He was trying too hard to meet the bar that show set. It did feel a, a little bit awkward. It did. I think it was the good kind of uncomfortable, though. That, sure. You know, you should try to be striving for it. Like, he comes across as a real heel. Right. And he, more than anyone, has had to battle the, you know, there's the thought of, oh, he's someone that is so entertaining that you can't stay a heel. He kind of destroys that, that stigma, that stereotype that you can't be an effective heel and truly hate it. That's what he felt like on this show. Right. His question is, considering the amount of content that needs to be filled in the next year, do you think WWE has it in them to keep Nakamura and Styles apart until an epic showdown in New Orleans? It has all the makings of an iconic Mania match, which we haven't had in years. You know, there's a lot of depth now at the top end of SmackDown, but that's going to be very tough to keep those two apart for so long. Mm -hmm. Um, My guess would be no. Yeah, uh, but I mean, that's not to say they can't have that match at Mania. You know, it could be the the blow-off of a long series. Uh, we will go to, let's go to Nick from Atlanta. Uh, that's pretty much the exact same question about oh, Nakamura okay. and Styles. I'm sure that's what a lot of people are interested in. Okay, Jesse from The Six. I can't believe Zayn and Owens are still on the same brand. The opening segment was interesting. Owens' music hits and the crowd cheers him wildly. Then he reads from the 1978 Basic Heel textbook and they boo him vociferously. Question, with the Leafs back in the playoffs, how will you treat them? Jump on the bandwagon as you do for the Jays and Raptors. Ignore them entirely as you did for two F- TFC. Or treat them <laughs> derisively as you did the only other time they made the playoffs during your show's tenure. For me, I'm going to wait till the second round. If they make the second round, then I'm, I'm, I'm buying a ticket Yeah, for, I, the, for the bandwagon. You know what? I, I really got into the Jays and stuff. Uh, do, I have zero time to, to follow any sports right now. Zero. So I don't think I'll, I'll watch... Pretty much anything. Mm. So don't expect any I'll hockey keep, chat. I'll keep, I'll keep you you keep me updated with the outside world. We go to Alan from Osaka, Japan. Question. Over the last few years, the WWE has shown it isn't shy about breaking the longevity record, seemingly because they're held by a performer they have issues with. 
Uh, for instance, AJ Lee being in a relationship with Punk, demolition and the brain injuries lawsuit. Do you think there's a chance they will try to break CM Punk's 434 day title run? I genuinely believe AJ would be able to pull it off on SmackDown, provided there was not another shakeup at some point. I, I don't think it makes, or provided there was another shakeup at some point. I don't think it makes any difference. Like it's not no, some but, to, to actively build to something just yeah. for that reason is stupid. No, well, for me, like I, I feel like all these long reigns are only as a result of like they're never planned. Yeah. I, I'm sure when Punk ha- won the title, they weren't planning for him to have the title reign for three four hundred thirty four days. It it simply occurred because there were no better options and no better opportunities for him to drop the title to anybody else at the time. Uh, so that's kind of a tough guess, and I also don't think that they're actively going to try to push AJ as a long reigning champion or anybody as a long reigning champion. If it happens, it happens. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. I don't see them setting out just to do it for. If for it's that like reason. 400 days in. And they're like, oh, shit, this guy hasn't lost the belt yet. Then they'll probably keep the belt on him to beat that record. Yeah, a lot of the yeah. times they just end up backdooring themselves. Like the Charlotte thing didn't start out as anything. The Undertaker's streak didn't start out as yeah. any kind of grand plan. Nikki, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, Gene from Pennsylvania. When Daniel Bryan came out, he basically said SmackDown gained the U.S. title. So the winner of Jericho versus Owens at Payback is who actually will be at SmackDown. Does this mean that the winner of Bray and Orton would be on? Yeah, we went over that. They never explained. They could, they could say that next week or not. They could just change their mind however they would like. If they feel that maybe Bray is better suited for SmackDown, they could put the title on him and he goes back. Or they could have Orton just beat him and Bray stays on Raw. I mean, they could do either one. All right. Everything's flexible. Uh, we go to Larry from East L.A. Question, looking way ahead, barring any injuries, with the call-ups and roster moves, how difficult do you guys think it will be to include everyone in this upcoming Royal Rumble? Uh, to me, it cuts down on the, the entrants that are just there for no reason. It feels like you have a better main event scene between both shows now that you could have more um, featured, pushed guys uh, than ever before, and you can cut out on the the Kalistos that are going to be in the match. How, the the Aiden Englishes. I think a better question would be how tough will will it be to fit everybody onto WrestleMania next year? Oh, it'll be an eighteen hour show next year. Sixty man battle royal. Do you like the idea of splitting up WrestleMania? Oh, uh, it's really uncharted territory. Like, how can you can you really expect to fill seventy five thousand? seats two nights in a row asking people to buy two tickets asking people to travel to that place in and out two times well they're already traveling they're i mean already I mean buying to, i mean to the arena i think you'd do it like realistically maybe not at the same price point you have now yeah but you make the offer that hey you can get a you know a seat on the floor for say three hundred dollars mm-hmm. or you could get for four fifty tickets there for both yeah. nights so essentially you're becoming like a coachella you're doing like a, yeah. a, a music festival but that also entails like like the, with those festivals people actually live you know they camp out for like a weekend or something i think it's doable um but with a stadium setting it's it's just they've never done it before uh so you risk having less attendance but uh, honestly like seeing the amount of demand for professional wrestling at this past weekend or the last wrestlemania weekend <laughs> I think they could actually do pretty well. Like, I, I do think that if they did split it up. I like, wouldn't split it Raw and SmackDown. I'd no. Mi- I'd mix the two. But, and you'd uh, need attractions. Like, you would need big attractions for both nights. Yeah. And I think it would mean, um, yeah, you would have to draw beyond just your roster of guys. What's the time limit per show? Then you can cap the show at three and a half to four hours each night. Then do you feel like there's a section of the audience that feels like they won't be getting that that value? I know we all complain about the show being too long. That's the biggest complaint. But the the, the way I feel like the consumer thinks is they're thinking about how many hours or how much how much am I how much value am I getting for this thing? I'm going to Costco. I don't need all this toilet paper. But man, it's so cheap. I have to. I, it's a good deal. It's you know? it's not the best comparison because it's not anywhere near the scale of a of a stadium show. But I mean, at the end of the G one and that marathon of touring, they do three nights at at Sumo Hall, and there've been there've been years they they sell out those, and it's 
It's spread out hmm. over three straight nights, and it's a lot of wrestling in three straight nights. Could they do three nights of WrestleMania? They kind of do already, but just not in the stadium. It listen. It's. I don't know if it'll happen next year. I don't think it would. Uh, I don't think it can happen logistically next year. Yeah. But when you look at this WrestleMania week and what it's grown to, and how much money mm-hmm. is spent by these fans for a lot of non WWE product, yeah. they could do NXT Hall of Fame. Two nights of WrestleMania, Raw, SmackDown. WrestleMania, night one, Chicago Ridge. <laughs> I don't think they're going to bring it to the Frontier <laughs> Fieldhouse. But, well. yeah, I think, I think it's doable. But it would, it would also require having the right attraction, something big for both nights. Yeah. Um, and once you do it, it's really tough to go back if, mm-hmm. say, the next year – you couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, like the, the Royal Rumble that one year, they made 40, and they realized this was a mistake. It was a positive to go back to 30. Now, this is a very different situation, but like if you're – like the planning for WrestleMania starts now. They, bu- they booked New Orleans mm-hmm. uh, a while back. So it's like you've got to know this well in advance if we're doing two nights or one night for a major stadium event. Mm-hmm. And the city – I don't think the city would have any problem with it. You're going to do another night at a stadium – I think they would draw. I mean, there's years WrestleMania does not sell out, contrary to what the WWE will tell you on television, and put a lot less people into the building than they announce. Um, but you could make up a lot of promotions where if you're buying one night of WrestleMania, will you spend 150 200 bucks more for a second night? I think a lot would. It's a very interesting proposal. I'm sure, I'm sure it's on their radar. It's the only event they could do it with. Mm. Joe from uh, Montreal here. Uh, has a lots of thoughts. He says, Kevin Owens, Charlotte, and the New Day are great additions. Rusev and Lana, to a lesser extent, Sami Zayn's a good pickup, but I thought SmackDown had Ziggler to do the same thing Zayn's been doing on Raw. I do feel Ziggler is going to get uh, a renewed push as a heel on this show. I mean... Not main event. I don't, I don't think so. He's going to job to Nakamura here, and then what? what's after that? No, maybe beats Nakamura. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's going to lose to Nakamura, and he'll be in the same spot. I think the time for him to turn was, would have been two, three months ago, and I think it should have come with a different packaging, you know, a new look, a new new theme music, new everything. Uh, until we get that, I don't see much change for him. All right. Let's do a few more here. Um, a lot of feedback oh this man, week. Oh, man, shit. Sorry. Um, I always closed it up. Oh. Okay, we'll go to Aditya from India. With Bray and The Miz gone, SmackDown Live lost two big heels, and AJ probably turned face to feud with Owens, which means now they have only Owens as their top heel and Corbin a mid-carder. One baby face needs to turn. Who would you prefer, Randy Orton, Sami Zayn, or Nakamura? I don't think it has to, I mean, of all those names, it would have to be Randy Orton, but I don't think it has to be any of them. Like, you got Rusev waiting, you know, as a potential top heel. Uh, I mean, Ziggler, we just talked about. I don't see him being a top heel, certainly, but he's somebody there. Uh, I just don't see Zayn or Nakamura being heels, ever. Yeah, and that's, I mean... Nakamura, just, maybe, mm, eventually, but... As a heel, that's... It's yeah, tough. it's definitely not possible now. But yeah. yeah, Orton easily could become a heel. Um, yeah, that's why Owens is in such a great spot. He is clearly the number one heel on yep. SmackDown. And Baron Corbin is like number two. So mm-hmm. I don't see him just wavering in the mid card by mm-hmm. any stretch. You could you could definitely say that maybe Ambrose turning on SmackDown, it would have been much better for his personal life and SmackDown does need heels. <laughs> like, I, I could make a stronger Wait, argument of Ambrose. You're saying if Dean Ambrose turned heel... He'd still be on SmackDown. And he and Renee may not be separated. Well, I'm stating that if that wow. was their decision, it, of course. Interesting. And maybe he wouldn't be married. I, I don't think that the brand <laughs> split led to their marriage way. The timing is, is irrefutable. They might have been engaged prior, but I mean, I I don't know the fact the combination of of, of the brand split hap- or the the draft this shakeup happening and the fact that they live in Vegas where marriages can take place in ten minutes. I I I don't know. I feel like I feel that's the the timing works itself out. Maybe they were just worried that if we do an engagement, they're going to make this a total divas wedding, and we do not want that. Yeah, which would be smart Maybe. on their part. All right. That's going to wrap up the show. A lengthy one. Thank you for listening. Uh, We've got more shows coming out this week. What's next on Thursday, as well as the MMA report, which will have Demetrius Johnson on the show, as well as comments from those coming out of UFC 210, including Dana White, 
Daniel Cormier and Anthony Johnson, the retired Anthony Johnson. Friday, we've got Keep It 2000 with a review of the February 28th, 2000 episode of Nitro with Ryan Satin jumping on with Nate Milton and Brian Mann to review that show. Sunday night on The Law, uh, it's going to be myself and Jason Agnew. And because of the NHL playoffs, uh, we are going to have a taped show um, that will be up on the site right at 11 Eastern um, with myself and Jason Agnew, uh, plus Ethan Page, who we spoke to down in Orlando. Uh, I think one of the most talented up-and-coming heels, uh, personalities, um, that is not signed to a, a major group. He's done a lot of great stuff in Evolve, and we will chat with him. An Ontario native, mm-hmm. Ethan Page. Uh, so that's all coming up Sunday night on The Law. You can check that out. Way is at Way0937. I am at I am John Pollock, and also chat, uh, uh, check out the new British Audio Wrestling, which is up with uh, Martin, who was in Orlando for WrestleMania week. Why didn't we run into him? We I was trying to figure out uh, times that we would run into him, and it's just our schedules didn't work out. I uh, but he and uh, Ollie and Benno they go through all of the UK cards that were happening in Orlando. Progress, WrestleMania. Rev Pro. Everything. Everything they go over. They also chat about um, the upcoming uh, World of Sport revival on ITV, the WWE launching a weekly UK show, um, Axel Dieter Jr. and his future. Lots of stuff to check out. A packed edition of British Audio maybe Wrestling. Maybe TJ Perkins' British accent. You know what? It got it got posted just before that, but I'm sure the next show will have to lead off with TJ Perkins and whether um, it was considered insensitive. Listen, Mr. Peanut. All right. TJ Perkins is going to take us out, and we'll chat with you next time. <laughs> okay. Listen here, Mr. Peanut. I hope you can hear me on that high horse you're sitting on, but I actually don't want to hear anything from you. You see, Austin Aries isn't the only one who's benefited from my bad luck. <laughs>